Well, today we're studying money and assets. And I want to present it to you from a number of dynamics and perspectives. And I need you to stay with me. Because if you understand the principles, then you will know how to apply them to your life and to your business, and to your family, or to your uh, business, to your church, to whatever organizations you lead. You see, it's very important to understand these principles. Uh, they, the principles don't change, but their application does. And a lot, there's a lot of noise in the world today. There's a lot of gurus, so-called, a lot of experts, so-called. And anybody who makes a little bit of money seems to have a course that they would love to sell you on how to do it. The problem is that that is almost a fundamental misunderstanding of how wealth is created and how, you, how one accumulates assets. And so today I'm going to dispel those myths and give you how it works and a framework for how you can make financial decisions so that you and your family can get ahead. First of all, it's important to note that in this modern era in which we live, very few governments use real money. All right, all of our currencies are based on what we call fiat currency, which actually fiat is a, a, sim, a synonym for fake. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Our fiat currencies inherently means that it's not real money, meaning it's just a piece of paper that we assign a value to. All right. Uh, usually, currency in its original form, and historically speaking, has always been backed by something of actual value. Okay, so let's say that uh, Kenya was going to put a million. Uh, 100 million Kenya shillings into circulation. Well, now they can just print that money. Historically speaking, you can't just print money. It has to be, you have to have that amount of gold or silver or copper or usually gold or silver. Uh, China has used some alternate things based on their natural resources, but usually it's been the gold standard. Uh, around the world. We'll even use that terminology. Well, this is the gold standard. And what we mean by that is that uh, uh, it is safe. Uh, it is real currency because it is backed by what we call a hard asset. Okay, a hard asset. A hard asset means it is something actually of value. Okay, and I'll get into that a little bit more later, but a hard asset would might be a home, a building, uh, a soft asset may be the brand of your company, but the buildings that your company owns is a hard asset, okay? So if you have a kiosk and you're selling fruit uh, or you have a salon and you're cutting hair and styling and you've got a booth, uh, the, the actual space would be a hard asset. The, the client list, the brand, your company name, those are soft assets, okay? So understanding the difference between hard assets and soft assets. Just because I can't touch and feel it does not mean it's not an asset. It just means it's not a hard asset. And when we're assigned, and the problem with hard, soft assets is hard assets usually have a defined value. A hard assets usually have a defined value. They are appraised. You can have a diamond ring appraised. A lot of the world's wealthiest diamonds have come from the African continent. You can have it appraised. You also have uh, 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 buildings that get appraised and you have equipment that get appraised and machinery that can be objectively appraised. But then soft assets are harder to appraise. There is usually emotion involved because you built the company uh, or you, you, you established whatever it was. And so the, it's called a soft asset. It's real. It's just not tangible. It's subjective value. It's what is it worth to the buyer? It doesn't matter to me that you spent 100 million shillings 
to dig a ditch and irrigate your fields. If I don't need irrigation in the fields, that field may only be worth 10,000 shillings to me, not 100,000 shillings. See? So that's a soft asset uh, in terms of what is it worth to the buyer. Uh, you may value your brand, but if I'm going to take your hard assets and start using them to increase my production under my brand, then your soft brand, your soft assets, your brand and your customer list and those things aren't of great value to me. So you may value them greatly and you may put a nice big price tag on them and I wouldn't give you one cent for it. So it's important to understand hard assets for soft assets. It's also important to understand that the money that you and I use is just paper that governments print and assign value. And here's the interesting thing about societies. We all agree to use said currencies as an exchange, uh, uh, as a basis of all value. Okay, so we assign a value to everything based on the assigned value that currencies have been given. Rather, it is, uh, uh, rather it's the, the South Sudanese pound, rather it's uh, the Deutsche Mark, whatever it is. And I can tell you there's been several in the last 200, 150, 200 years, there's been uh, really uh, three major currencies. Uh, the world has what we call reserve currencies, okay? Reserve currencies which is the global standard of value, financial monetary value. Right now, I, I think even as of today, it's about 55 or 58 percent of uh, the weight of the currency reserve is the U.S. dollar. The U.S. dollar is by far the, the leading currency reserve for the world. That what that means is that every currency in the world ties its valuation of its currency to the U.S. dollar. A lot of times, analysts and financial uh, analysts will use the words peg. It is, oh, most of the currencies are pegged to the U.S. dollar. It's tied to the U.S. dollar. The Kenya shilling is tied to the U.S. dollar. The South Sudanese pound is tied to the U.S. dollar. That is the world's leading currency reserve today. It's one of the reasons why China loaned money to the United States. It was so that they could, uh, they did not have many dollars, which is the leading currency in the world. And so they needed to have more of that asset. And so they started loaning money to the U.S. that would have to be repaid in dollars, which is how they accumulated and are accumulating a lot of their wealth. Now, The, the second, there's only three currency reserves in the world. The U.S. dollar is the leader. In a far distant second is the euro at about 24% or so. And then the Japanese yen is the third strongest currency in the world. Okay. Uh, the uh, Chinese uh, uh, Remniba and um, uh, Remniba, that uh, they it is increasing in strength, but it's really it's about the fifth strongest currency in the world, and it has a long way to go before it is the leading currency reserve. And I do expect that about uh, forty years from now, I would say, if the Lord tarries, uh, I would say in the year twenty sixty, uh, I would not be surprised if between twenty sixty or twenty sixty five somewhere in between there, that uh, the Chinese uh, remember becomes the leading currency in the world because America is on a decline and China is, the, is in terms of a world empire. Uh, we are, 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 because of all of the factors that determine what is a world empire, uh, uh, we are in st about stage five of six of the decline three being the height, one and two are rising, and, and three and four are kind of at the peak, and then five and six is the decline, and right now we're in five. Ironically enough, so if we're on this curve, this bell curve, 
at the same time that we're right here, halfway down the decline, China is on number two and three, and they're on the rise. Okay, so right now, that's why you're seeing Russia and Ukraine. It's why you're seeing so many of the power moves in the world. It's why you're seeing a lot of the things unfolding that you are, because you have two, you have a rising world empire testing the strength and the financial wherewithal and the forms of government are being taxed and tested uh, by the declining world empire and the rising world empire. So understanding that shillings, dollars, yen, yuan, euros, remimbas, uh, ruby, ruples, you know, pounds, all of these, the marks, all of these currencies are tied to the US dollar, which is why it is still the preferred currency in the world. What I will tell you is that even though the United States is on a decline, every world empire where their currency has been the, 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 the global currency reserve, which it always is, it usually takes about uh, 25 to 30 years after the end of the empire before they switch to the new empire's currency as being the leader and trustworthy, that it's stable enough because it takes time for a new empire to find its footing. I know this firsthand with the work that I do on the United States delegation to South Sudan. It is unbelievably challenging and difficult to establish a new nation, to establish financial markets, to, to give strength to currency, to give meaning to currency, because so many coups around the world has quickly destroyed the value of a pound or a shilling or a ruple or an impesa or, or a euro. Uh, uh, it is time and time again, history shows that every currency has failed, has ended, which means, this means, ladies and gentlemen, you must understand what I'm teaching you today so that you are not harmed, so that you are not caught unawares, so that your family can prosper, so that your companies can prosper, and so that you can help others to prepare. So as we begin, I want to express the difference between assets and liabilities. I use the term assets and explain hard assets versus soft assets. And I'm going to go in greater detail when I give you the three ways of making money. When I give you the only three ways in the world of making money, I'm going to go deeper into the assets, okay? Because there's three asset classes. And I'm going to give you those because they're the only way you can make money ever in whatever the form of money whatever form money takes. Because as you know, money in uh, high inflationary periods, a lot of times takes on bartering and trade. That's still currency. Your cow is currency, can be currency, yes? Because the cow is a hard asset, and has an assigned value, and you can trade that for something else of equal value. You may want a motorbike, and you may it may be determined that three cows equal a good motorbike or two of this, or one cow and two goats, or whatever the arrangement, but there's a signed value because it's tangible hard assets. So the difference between assets and liabilities here, what the world will tell you, and what business schools tell you, and what every financial book out there tells you, is that uh, assets are, uh, they would count things like your home, as an asset. They count things that uh, are tangible as assets. They don't really even distinguish between hard assets and soft assets, except that they hardly ever give any value to soft assets. Basically, if it's tangible, they call it an asset. If you go to your banker, if you go to the African Development Bank, they won't accept goodwill as part of the assets, <laughs> right, for your business. Goodwill 
everybody has it, so it, which makes it not very valuable. Unless it's Coca-Cola or Apple or IBM, you don't have much goodwill, <laughs> okay? Because there's not a track record with the world. You individually, your company doesn't have enough goodwill to even call it goodwill most of the time. Uh, unless you're number one or number two in your industry which means the only assets a bank would take for collateral is something tangible. They want your automobile. They may want your animals. They may want your farm. They may want your uh, livestock. They, they want electronics or, or uh, things of tangible things of value, okay? Uh, they do not consider clothes an asset unless it is perhaps like uh, a fur coat or something that might increase in value. Uh, but by and large, clothing is not an asset. Clothing is a liability, okay? Uh, so that is the way most economists will teach you about assets. Uh, and they will tell you that the, the, the money game is about acquiring assets, acquiring assets. And they're not wrong, but they're not completely right. Does that make sense? They're not wrong. They're just not completely right. Here's what I mean. I bought into this school of thought. I started accumulating assets when I was 19 years old. I ended up with several million dollars in real estate property. And I thought that because I was accumulating assets that I was rich, that I was wealthy. And I learned real quick that what the banker calls assets might be assets to them, but it's not an asset to me. The reason it was an asset to them was because it was debt to me. But debt on my books or a liability, a mortgage, and a debt to me is an asset to them. Isn't that something? Because I'm the one that owes the money. And they're the ones that it's owed to. So to them, the debt for that real estate was an asset. To me, the real estate actually became a liability. And that, along with some other schools of thought, is why I say they are correct that it is an asset, but it's an asset for them, not for you. You will get hurt if you do not understand the difference between assets and liabilities as it relates to you. I, I want you to understand that they're not lying. It is an asset. It's just not an asset to you. It's an asset to them. If you get property and land and you take out a loan, you don't have owned that land until it is paid off. If you think it is your land, miss a payment and see, miss two payments, miss three payments to the bank and see if, they, if it's still your land or if they'll take it back. It's not your land which means it's not your asset. It's their asset. It's your liability. You're the one that owes a bill every month. So what has happened is, is the way I define assets versus liabilities in a way that I understand the banker's way and the economist's way of describing assets and liabilities. And there is truth to that. And especially in business, you do want as many hard assets as possible. But I've learned to redefine assets and liabilities as it pertains to the individual and as it pertains to the SME. Assets as defined by, to an individual and to the small business and the entrepreneur is assets make you money Liabilities cost you money. Assets make money, liabilities cost money. If you will keep that simple phrase and teaching in your mind and absorb it in your heart, you will make better financial decisions. You will make better financial decisions. I rarely like to spend money unless it is on assets, which means it needs to make money. 
even the horse and the horses and animals that we get. We want to make use to make money. Just like you use livestock to make money as well. And it's very biblical to use livestock and herds in wealth creation and crops and agriculture, which you are experts at as well. But that is real, that is real assets because it makes money. Uh, if, if there are certain toys that we have, such as my wife and I enjoy a good motorcycle ride and we'll get on and it's very smooth and we can put it on cruise control. Uh, our motorcycle, it's a BMW K1200 uh, li LT, a limited touring bike. And so it's got heated handlebars. It's got heated seats. Her, it's got heated, uh, it's got a separate play, uh, earbuds and charging station in the back for her. It has armrests for her back there and a beautiful a back. It's got storage compartments in the back and on the sides. Uh, and it's very, very smooth. And it can go fast and go very smooth. And it's very safe. And uh, it's got a 10 disc CD changer plus a single CD changer in the front. So you could be playing different tunes. If someone calls me, I can hit the mute button and be talking to them uh, while you're going down the road. It's a nice motorcycle, but here's the problem with the motorcycle. It is a liability. Unless I started renting that motorcycle out to make money, right now it sits in the shop, it sits in the garage, and it does not go unless it is for, for enjoyment. Now, I will say there are some things that if I use it to decompress or to de-stress, that I actually do consider that part of the asset creation because if I did not have certain outlets because of how high stress environments I work in, I need certain recreational outlets. And so if that was one that I needed, then it actually would be an asset because it enables me to be in the right frame of mind to earn income and to run the companies. Does that make sense? I'm giving you a way to think about assets and liabilities. Assets make money, liabilities cost money. So I could own a home, and if I rent that home out, and that means they're paying me rent, then I'm making money, that home is an asset. However, if I live in that home and I do not rent it out, that home does nothing but cost me money. Now, my own home is a liability. Does that make sense? So not all homes are real. Not all homes are good assets because if it costs you money, it's a liability, not an asset. So the way I look at things is how can I turn liabilities into assets? How can you turn current liabilities into assets? If you want to turn a home that you live in from a liability into an asset, you can do it simply with like an Airbnb. Have a room and rent out that room. You may make a uh, 1,000 USD a month just from renting out a room in your home. Uh, and that provides extra income. And all of a sudden, it pays all of the bills for your home. And you're, you're still getting to live there. It's like you're getting to live there for free because it pays your mortgage. It pays your debt. What used to be an a, a liability now becomes an asset. OK, uh, or if you use the land to make money from your home, so uh, then that is a way to turn your liability into an asset. These are the way this is how you need to think. Uh, even whenever I go into companies, we used to have what we call profit centers. And then we had uh, administration and things that did not generate revenue. What I always try to do was look at each department and say, how can I turn this department into a profit center? How can I get this part, uh, this this uh, this division to pay for itself? Okay, uh, and and so it is understanding that assets should generate income, or is it a liability? I would also note here that not all liabilities are avoidable, nor should all liabilities be avoided. Okay, an automobile, most of the time, is a liability, except for the by itself. Okay, 
except for the fact that if I'm using my automobile to get to a job or to my business that pays for the automobile, then I wouldn't be able to have the automobile without going there. The problem is that that asset, it's what we either call an appreciating asset or a depreciating asset. Okay, I said there's hard assets and soft assets. There's also appreciating assets and depreciating assets. Vehicles usually are a depreciating asset. Now, why is that? Because the, if you buy a brand new car off the showroom floor, you're going to pay top dollar. Literally, if you buy the car, drive it off the showroom floor, come back in one hour and say, I don't want the automobile anymore. I want to return the car. You would lose probably, depending on how much the vehicle costs to begin with. Uh, well, I can just tell you, if you bought an $80,000 car, you're going to lose about 10 or $12,000. So you're about 10 to 15%. The moment, the moment, it drives out of that showroom floor. The moment it has had one owner, it drops in value 10 to 15%. So that is a depreciating asset. And the older a car gets, the less it's worth, right? The older it is, the less it's worth. Why? Because the less reliable it becomes, the more it breaks down, the more frequently it breaks down, the more the parts rust, the more the parts break. Tires have to be replaced, brakes have to be replaced, Things break on it. The batteries have to be replaced. Uh, the air conditioning goes out. The, this is a problem. And that's a problem. And as cars get older, they break down more and more. They get less. They become worth less and less, which means it's a it is still an asset because you can still sell it for something, but it is a depreciating asset. You don't want to invest your money into depreciating assets, or you'll take what little money you have, buy a depreciating asset. And then that your money just goes away to nothing. The goal is to take whatever you have, however much or however little, and invest in appreciating assets, in appreciating assets. And I'm going to give you those appreciating asset classes, three appreciating asset classes momentarily. But first, like I said, not all liabilities can be avoided. Uh, I pay a utility bill, I pay water bills, I pay sewer bills, I pay phone bills, and uh, trash bills, I, I, you know, probably bills I don't know I pay. And I can tell you that these bills do not make me money except for the fact that I'm able to live comfortably and have the resources I need. If I did not have electricity, I could not be broadcasting you to you today. If I did not pay the cell phone bill, I could not be able to broadcast to you or communicate with you. Okay, so in a, in a, in, in a sense, and in essence, they contribute, but they in and of themselves are not uh, assets, they're liabilities. They're the cost of doing business. I'm paying for the electricity. It's not paying me to use it. Although there are ways you can get paid for the very electricity if the place that you own produces more electricity than you use, most power grids in the world will buy it back from you because they're trying to buy power. They're buying power from different sources. So that's why some people actually set up on their properties uh, their own electrical generation plants, if you will, uh, because if they end up producing more than they use, then by law in the United States and, and in other, some other countries, uh, the utility companies must buy it from you so they can use it. But those are the exceptions. Same thing with the automobiles. There, I said automobiles are a depreciating asset. There are certain instances, and I said usually because there are certain instances where automobiles can be appreciating assets. If you own a rare classic car, those appreciate in value. If you own a rare coin, it might have been a silver dollar, but a silver dollar is not worth one dollar in the United States, even though it's a silver dollar. It's because the silver is now worth more. And in fact, 
we recently sold one. It was over a hundred dollars what we got for that coin, or around thereabouts. So I say that because so that you understand appreciating assets, even liabilities, if you buy right, could be an appreciating asset, including your own home. Uh, also, the asset is only an asset if you have access to the money. What I realized whenever I first listened to all of the financial experts and accumulated several million dollars in real estate assets, the hard lesson that I learned was that you cannot eat real estate. I started to learn the difference between liquid assets and fixed assets. Liquid assets versus hard assets and or fixed assets. If you have, like we, we own land right now, okay, and properties. But I can tell you, unless the land sells, it doesn't matter what it's worth. I can't tap into its worth. I can take that land to the bank and the bank tells me your asset is worth 100,000 USD. But that does no good if no one is paying for 100,000 USD for the land or if the land is in an undesirable place. The bank may say it's worth, it's a $100,000 asset, but practically speaking, it might be worth next to nothing. You have to understand these things. If not, you'll hear people tell you how to go make money in real estate or in business or in the stock markets or in, in Bitcoin and in crypto. And so you just go do it and you don't understand what you're buying. You don't understand what asset class you're playing in. You don't understand what the peaks and the valleys are. You don't understand where in the life cycle the currencies are because they all rise and fall. You don't understand that every government on earth, every seven to 10 years goes through at least a mild recession. And globally, inflation is hitting uh, like it hasn't for 40 some years. Right now, because of the time of COVID and the strain on the global financial markets that it produced. And because of how much fiat currency so many countries printed to buoy themselves artificially to get through the insane lockdowns that destroyed businesses and people. So they tried to print their way out of it and they are now having to pay the piper, except we are the ones paying the piper because your fuel prices are astronomical. It's all tied together. And you must understand that three years ago, when they said, or two years ago, when they said two weeks to flatten the curve, just wear a mask for two weeks, 14 days to flatten the curve, and we'll be through this. That very day, I knew it was a lie. That very day, I knew it was a farce. Nobody would ever say something like that unless there was a greater plan. And now we see it at full on full display. And in order to keep printing more money, we need to have another pandemic. There, sometimes they try to resurrect COVID, but there's so much COVID fatigue around the world that more recently they're putting out things and calling it, there's a rise of monkeypox. Well, monkeypox has, has been called for ages. Uh, the shingles, and people all around the world have had the shingles. But whenever you look at what they're calling monkeypox, it is nothing but shingles. But they renamed it because they have to keep a new boogeyman out in order to keep printing more money, in order to keep booing the markets so that people can keep making money and getting rich artificially. However, it is done on the backs of hardworking men and women all over the world that are barely able to put food on their table. But you know why they're able to do it and get by with it? Because you and I and people around the world have not understood, people of God have not understood financial principles found in God's word.
Because if we did, if we understood it the way we should, then we would know these things up front and immediate, and they would not be able to fleece us the way that they do over and over and over again. The only reason they keep doing it is because we don't learn. And that's why I believe this lesson today is so extremely critical and valuable to the African continent for today, for tomorrow, and for generations to come. Assets and liabilities. And I was would make an asterisk here and say not everything has to be an asset or liability. Not everything has to have a return, a return on investment. Okay, so for example, uh, I invest in my wife, but I don't have a financial return from that, but she is an asset even though she does not make you money, right? But she's not a liability because she costs you money. So that is a soft asset, but a very, very, very real asset, okay? Your mother, you don't ask what the return on invest, the ROI is for your mother, do you? No, you take care of your mom because she gave life to you. She nurtured you. And so not everything should be boiled down to assets or liabilities. I say that out of caution because I did. I made that mistake. I became so asset and liability conscious that I actually ascribed relationships that I should not have as liabilities instead of assets. You understand the paradox of all of this? It's such a paradox and much of life is. I'm speaking strictly in terms of monetary gain and not all of life when I speak of assets and liabilities in this context. I must give that caution so that no one takes it to the extreme like I did. Now, I want to give you the three money-making assets, three money-making asset classes. Every dollar that is made in this world is made one of these three ways. And you need to understand them. You need to understand them. Because like I told you, every country goes through a minor, if not full-blown recession, every seven to 10 years. And that's because of greed. Just the same reason why empires rise and fall. At some point, we've made so much money that we get comfortable and stop working as hard. And we start enter entertaining ourselves more and recreating more because that's what is the natural course to do at the more money you make. And, uh, you know, retirement is a really new thought. People did not retire in ancient times. You just worked because that's what we're called to do. But retirement and recreation and do nothing and uh, entertain yourself all day, every day, and just play golf and boat and travel the world. And that's a modern socialist, socialistic, carnal view of life. God does not give kingdom entrepreneurs vast resources to squander it on themselves, on their own fleshly lusts, okay? He doesn't do it. Succeeding as an entrepreneur is not so that you can have the big house and the big yacht and the planes. Although I must say that yachts and planes and, and houses and second houses and islands and homes in other countries are assets, can be assets. If God blesses you financially enough to buy a yacht, buy the yacht through your business. And then use that to entertain clients and prospective clients so you can close more business. Let them bring their family for a few days and enjoy your island, your lake house, 
your special farm. Fly them on your planes. Use your own plane to get to your different offices in other countries faster so that your time is more efficient. So that you can be a blessing to more people and reach more people. See, that's how you turn what would be a liability into an asset. Here are the three asset classes. Number one, real estate. Number two, financial markets. And number three, business. Business. Now I'm going to cover each one of those, but let me go back and say, I told you that every seven to 10 years, countries have a minor recession. They have a major depression, usually every 50 to 100 years. After about five to 10 de of these minor recessions, they end up usually having a major depression, okay? We've had a minor, the United States had a recession after 2001, after the September 11th attacks. We had a minor, we also had another recession after the 2008 housing bubble, the, the crash of 2008. We are current, currently, uh, and we've known for about three years, in fact, we really knew once they started printing money with COVID, that we're going to have a bubble. We knew that the student loan market was a bubble. We knew that the housing prices were getting astronomical. When the prices of hard assets no longer resemble actual value, then you know you're in a bubble. Did you hear me? That's how you can know before your own government knows. When the, when the cost of an asset is higher than its actual value, that's when that market segment and that industry is in a bubble. So for example, when there is a house that would cost 10 million shillings to build, and they're selling that same house for 30 million shillings, you know you're in a housing bubble because I can build it cheaper than I could buy it. But that pendulum always swings to where you can buy, where it's cheaper to buy than to build. And part of this, a lot of this is all because of supply and demand, which we spoke about last week in last week's lesson, supply and demand. So it is good to know that every seven to 10 years, there's a minor recession. Every 50 to 100 years, there's a de major depression in each country. And then every 150 to 200 years, there's usually a major shift in the power structure of the world. There's a new world empire on the scene. Okay, before the United States, it was the British Empire, which you know all too well because of the colonization of Africa. America, imperialism and, and as an empire, has looked different than what the British did. I'm not going to espouse on whether right or wrong, but the strategies were different in how they chose to conquer the world and become global empires. And China has its own strategy of doing that, and they are succeeding, and they will succeed. And I think there's biblical reasons, actually, for their success, regardless of some of the atrocities human rights atrocities and so forth. There's also some principles in God's word that they actually honor innately in their culture. Many things very sinfully. And then some very, that are right, such as the family hierarchy and honoring their father and mother. Uh, and some other things that they hold very dear. Uh, even though they, there's so many things that are wrong, there's also things that are right. And they are the only world empire that this will be their fourth time of being a, the world empire. The fourth time. No other global empire has even reigned a second time. Usually, once a world empire goes down, they're done. Now, they're still going to be a country. We'll, the United States will still be a country. Just like France used to be a world empire. Persia, go, if you go back to the ancient days, the Persian dynasty, the Greek dynasty, the Greeks are still around, right? 
Persian Empire, Babylonian Empire, the Egyptian Empire, there's still Egypt, but nobody would consider Egypt anywhere near a world empire, right? They're just a country. But China will end up being having their fourth reign as a global empire. I tell you these things so that you know how to invest and when to invest. And here's the other caveat you need to understand. Depending on your current age and your life expectancy, that changes which one of these three asset classes I just gave you, you should invest in. And where in this asset that the debt and credit cycle we are, and your country is in, and my country is in, and the world as a whole. Because what happens is, as companies and as governments and as people or as companies get better, their balance sheet looks better, we extend credit, right? The more credit worthy you are, you get more credit. Well, guess what most of you and companies and governments do? With more credit, they take on more debt. Well, guess what debt always does to you, your family, your company, and your governments? We always overextend in the good times, and that debt always crushes us in time. Okay? So that is why you need to understand where we are in the credit and debt cycles and the recessions and the depressions and how that relates to how old you are right now. Because if you only have, let's say you're 70 years old and you expect to live 10 more years, you probably do not want to invest in real estate unless you're planning on handing it down to your posterity. Okay, if you are looking to make money, then you would, the fastest way to usually do it is in financial markets uh, or in business. But in each of these three asset classes, if let's say you are 75 and you expect to live five more years, if you put your money in the stock market right now, you're going to lose money more and more and more until you die because it's in a correction. The United States, on which every other country feels the effects of whatever goes good or whatever goes bad here, it's been said that whenever America sneezes, all the other countries in the world get a cold. It's always more severe if we have a hiccup it can take out other countries. And so I tell you these things to protect your own family, your own assets, that of your company and that of your business. So if you had five years left, you don't want to invest in the financial markets today. That might be different in three years or two years. We had one negative growth quarter, GDP. The moment, which we'll know in July, a June this month ends our second quarter. You, a country is officially in a recession if it goes two consecutive quarters with negative GDP. We've had one quarter. I expect this quarter will be negative GDP, and we will now be classified the recession of 2022. Depending on how deep that recession goes, it may even be another great recession, which we were actually overdue for because it's been 14 years since the last Great Recession, 2008, 2007, 2008. And we knew in 2018, the market should be exploding right now. We should be having a recession. It should go into a bear market. Why is it not? And then COVID hit and they started printing all of the money. And I will tell you about every hundred years, there's always a surprise anomaly that you cannot plan for. Remember the Spanish flu in the 1920s. It's one of the contributing factors to the Great Depression. But you had the Spanish flu that killed infinitely greater number percentage basis than COVID. That's why COVID, COVID killed less people than pneumonia does every year. But it's because it was different and because it was lab generated and it was 
biological warfare. Three ways, real estate, financial markets, and business. Those are the three asset classes. Which one you invest in, and, uh, and by the way, what if you study the top 100 list or 400 list, Forbes 400, 400 wealthiest people in the world, most of them, I think it's over 70% of them, made their money through business. Even now, the richest man, in fact, the two richest men in the world, Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and even, even a couple of the one from Mexico and India, these men, they all, most of their wealth is tied up in business assets. That's where their wealth comes from. But like everything I said, it's, you only realize that wealth when it's sold. So if Elon Musk sold his stake in Tesla and SpaceX and takes his $240 billion, then he no longer is in business assets. His assets now switched entirely to the financial markets. So he moved from one asset class to another. But here's the deal. You don't want to do that in a recession. You don't want to put your money in financial markets right now. What he has done and what he has even advised others to do and what we all, uh, what I advise everyone to do is when you're going into a recession, you want, you want to take your money out of the market. Only poor, only average investors say, just put it in and forget about it. Well, that sounds like the, the man with the talent that just went and hit it in the ground. Just bury it and forget about it, and then you'll just hopefully come out on top. No, that's not the way we're supposed to do as kingdom entrepreneurs. Your business is supposed to generate income. Your business is supposed to generate increase in assets. Many times in the Old Testament, Abraham increased in his flocks and his wealth. And Job increased in his flocks and his herds and increased in wealth. We should be in the business of multiplying. And you multiply with asset accumulation. But you have to understand some assets are hard, some are soft, some are fixed, some are liquid. If you need to have enough liquid assets, the problem was I didn't realize there were different assets. I thought an asset was an asset. And that was the end of the story. But guess what? I didn't have food to eat. I had several million dollars in real estate. You couldn't pay the light bill. Now, that doesn't make any sense, does it? But that's why when you read all of the things in the world about, oh, this person has all this money, it's not like that money is sitting in the bank and they can just write a check. It's tied up in their business. It's tied up in real estate. It might be tied up in commercial, commercial high rises and buildings. It's the ability to convert that asset to cash. It's how liquid is that asset. If it's a financial instrument, like a stock or bond, at least stocks, most stocks you can sell and have the money in your bank account tomorrow. So you'll have money to be able to eat uh, as you need. Financial instruments are usually more liquid unless you are in the lending business. If you are a lender and I loan you $10,000 and you have to pay me back $12,000, then, then I count that as an asset, but I don't actually have the money. So I could loan out millions, $5 million, and I can say I have $5 million in assets. But I don't have a single dollar left to give or to eat. But I got $5 million in assets. So... I had to get to the place where I stopped just trying to accumulate assets for the sake of accumulating assets and accumulate the right mix of assets. So you've got to have liquid assets and you do still want fixed assets because in times of recession, if you take the liquid assets or excuse me, the uh, uh, 
financial markets and put that in, especially in the last couple of years where it's been 0% interest rates by the Federal Reserve, 0%, which means if you're a lender, you're actually in the negative percent. It's costing you money to lend, which means the government has to pay you to lend money to people or else the money supply dries up. And so this is the time to buy appreciating fixed assets that generate income. It is not the time to buy liabilities, uh, but as we get through this recession, a lot of people will liquidate their hard assets, maybe some, some of their property. They'll liquidate some of the property, some of the land, some of the real estate, uh, and they will, and even, uh, uh, maybe even some of the financial instruments they have, uh, debt, and they will invest in commercial, the financial markets again. Now, I want to explain that everything you do to make money now falls right now under one of those three asset classes. And I want to tie this lesson back to the very, one of the very first lessons that I gave in Rolling College this year, which was understanding ESBI, uh, the employee, the small business. Remember that quadrant, ESBI, employee, small business, uh, uh, or excuse me, uh, the sole solopreneur, uh, uh, and then the uh, business owner, the self-employed business owner, and the investor. ESBI, employee, self-employed business owner, investor. You can do, you can you make money in these three asset classes in one of those four quadrants, okay? So in, inside of real estate, you may be the one owning the real estate. You may be the one, uh, and there's a bunch of ways to make money in that. You may be the lender. You may, uh, you may own a business by be, starting a title company in the real estate industry. So you're kind of in two of the three asset classes. You own a title company and you take the money that you make from your business and you buy financial instruments, financial market, or real estate. Okay, that's what everyone tries to do that becomes wealthy, is they start to, they, they make their money in the business sector. 70% of the uh, wealthiest people in the world made it in business. And then they take that and invest it in financial markets or in real estate, and usually and in real estate. The, the real estate holdings of the, of the top 400 wealthiest people is extensive. It's vast. They love real estate. One of the main reasons is because they're not making more of it, right? God's not making uh, new, new countries in the middle of the ocean right now. We don't have new land masses popping up. So there's a limited supply. And I go back to supply and demand. Uh, and so that's why they say the number one rule in real estate investing is location, location, location. And uh, I also say that, that uh, timing, timing, timing. Real estate's about timing. There's a lot of different ways to invest. I have made money investing where I bought homes that were falling apart and resold them to people who wanted to fix them up. And then I could make a, a margin on that. Okay. And then I can sell it in a week or I can sell it in a month. And then there's people who take three months to, to uh, fix it up. And then they take a couple months to sell it and they make much more money. Maybe they make 20 to 30,000 USD on that property. Whereas I only make five or six or seven. Or there's people who buy a home and rent it out and sell it 20 years from now and make 100,000 on it because they've ridden out those recession periods. And they wait for the market to come back up, which is fine if you're young and if you're still going to be around 10 years for the market to come back. So there's the principles of these three asset classes and the right decision for you depends on where you are in life, what investments you currently have, which assets you currently have, and uh, what your objectives are. That's right. why there's no one right formula. I could go make money in real estate, and I have, 
But if I told you to go do the same thing, it may or may not work at this exact moment. I don't use the same strategies at all times because you have to understand the markets. You have to understand where you are in the debt cycles, the credit cycles, personally, and as a country and the market itself. So there's real estate and there's, uh, you could be a realtor. So let's say I'm gonna take that asset class real estate and show you how you can be ESB or I. If you're a, if you are a realtor, you are self-employed. You're in the S quadrant. If you hire an administrative assistant to help answer all of your phone calls from the prospective buyers, that person is in real estate as well, but they're an employee. Okay. Or let's say you start a title company, a closing company to be able to do the title work. That puts you in the B quadrant. Now you're a business owner in the real estate in that asset class. And if you do it long enough and you hire the right people, you're going to be able to either open more title companies, make more money. You don't have to be there, which is the true business owner, the difference between self-employed. And then you can start investing. You may invest in real estate. You may start investing in, in commercial property. You may start investing in multifamily properties and apartments or condos or beach communities or lake houses uh, or certain segments of the market. You may uh, do Airbnb rentals. You may, but, but even that's going to change. That's not a strategy, a forever strategy. That's why all of these books on how to become a millionaire with Airbnb, that's great for, for last year. Yes, you can still make money on that. But these people who are building portfolios built on Airbnb, why would you build your entire life on something that probably won't even be around in a few years? And it won't be around because things change. The companies that we're not even going to be using cell phones 20 years from now. It'll be something else. We don't play stereo uh, uh, records anymore. It's changed. People then couldn't have imagined it ever changing. Can you imagine the day when you no longer would have a landline in your home? Now, you know, very few people, unless they're quite senior in age, uh, most people don't have that. They just use their mobile device as their phone. So real estate, and I have made, I have done very well in real estate. First Lady and I own real estate now. We're very thankful for it. But we also recognize the pros and the cons of owning that asset class. We have experienced joy and we have experienced pain with on both sides with that asset class. Because right now, the housing bubble in the United States is about to burst. So a property that really is only worth about 300 or 325,000 is going for 450,000. That's a bubble. It's not worth that. So what's going to happen is we go into a recession. The real estate prices fall. Now you can only get 300 some thousand dollars for your house. You should have sold when it was 450,000. Or you're going to live in it for the next 20 years. And it doesn't matter if the price goes up and down. But at some point, as you get older, you're going to want to sell it at when you're in one of those up cycles, which happens every 10, 7 to 10 years. That's how you know when to buy, when to go in this asset class and when to move out of that asset class and when to move into this other asset class. Financial markets, there's, I mean, there are so many ways. Like I said, you could be a lender, you could do debt, you can invest in stocks, you can invest in bonds, you can invest directly in companies that give you stock in that company that's not even on a publicly traded exchange. You can invest in stock markets in the United States, you can invest in markets in China, in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Europe. Uh, you can you can invest in bonds, government bonds, school bonds, county bonds, state bonds, uh, government notes. There's a lot of different ways, an endless number of places to invest. But if you invest in one company versus another, you might lose money in this company, but you may get a thousand percent return by investing in this other company. If you had invested in Apple or Berkshire Hathaway or Amazon or Tesla, then you would have done very, very well. But 
uh, there's other stocks that you would have made nothing. One of the best ways is uh, if you're not, is to educate yourself. And let me say this about all three asset classes is understanding risk. There's risk with all of it. But to me, the risk is only associated with to your degree of knowledge, to how much education you, to the degree you have educated yourself about the industry you're investing in. If I'm going to invest in a company, I'm going to have done a lot of education into that company. And I'm investing in the management team. I'm investing in the leadership. I'm investing in people that I've looked eyeball to eyeball. And I know they're going to take care of my money better than if I took than if it was mine. Because it is mine and they're taking care of it. I want them taking better care of my money than they do their own. But you have to you have to see that it may it's not that stocks are bad or stocks are good it's which stocks are good and at what time and a lot of those things are outside of your variable they're variables outside of your control if you aren't the one leading the company you don't have a say you don't know you might, you can have proxy votes and what have, what have you but to affect real change, unless you're a majority shareholder, you're at the whim of the company. So in the United States, there that's what morphed into mutual funds and EFTs and these other things where rights, where real estate invested, uh, uh, investing uh, funds, real, a, a right was basically a mutual funds of real estate companies. So maybe you're not good at picking out real estate, or maybe you don't have 100,000 USD to go buy property and rent it out or to fix it up. But you can take 500 USD and invest it in a right, which is a, fi which is a financial instrument, but it's tied to real estate. So now you're in two asset classes. You don't have to have the knowledge. There's experts that are investing that into real estate that do know how to get a return through real estate. So you're investing in the financial market that is in turn investing in real estate market. The only downside of that is if the real estate market starts to go down, then you're going to go down even though you're in the financial markets and they may be up. Now, there's also things what we call the S&P. There are funds that just take the average of the top traded stocks and you go with that. That is an average, a market average, which over time has gone up an average of 10% a year. There's some years it goes down. There's some years it goes up 15 or 20%. But all in all, it's usually about a 10, 11% return. Uh, and so financial markets is if you're investing in them as a whole and not trying to individually pick the winners and losers, then you actually could come out on top over time and generations. But that's playing the 40 year game, the long game. And you might have to play the 50 or 60 year game, depending on where we are in that credit and debt cycle. If we're 20 years from a Great Depression, it's going to be 60 years. But there, I can tell you that after every Great Depression, or excuse me, after every boom time, there's the bust, right? We call it the Roaring Twenties. Why is it called the Roaring Twenties? Because money was abundant and free. Credit was a, a free. So it was, we became over indebted, which caused the Great Depression. And then, of course, at the same time, the Spanish flu in the late 20s. And so in, in every 100 years or so, there is a, there is a pandemic. Or there's a global flood, or, or not a global, but there's a flooding that takes out the crops. Or there is a locust problem that destroys crops and agriculture. Uh, there's every hundred years or so, and even more frequent in certain regions of the world, there's always anomalies that you don't plan for. Scripture gives a lot of things on crop rotation, on animal rotation, on uh, how to prepare for the anomalies of nature and of the earth. And so I think it would behoove you to study that as well. So three asset classes, real estate, financial markets, and business. Uh, if you make your money in business, then invest it in, keep investing it in your business or in other businesses and in other industries so that if, if yours takes a hit, other industries are going up. Or when real estate is going down, maybe the markets are going up or vice versa. Or when markets are going down, take your money out and putting into assets because every time, we're right now entering a time of high inflation. It's going to get a lot worse. 
Well, don't have your money in financial instruments. I would pull it all out and put it into assets that are going to appreciate exponentially because of the inflation. When we come out of this, some of our assets are going to be worth much more because of it. So recession is not a bad thing for me. And recession does not have to be a bad thing for you. You can actually get wealthier. Why do you think that the richest people in the world don't mind recessions or depressions? It only hurts the little people who don't have this information. They get rich during the recession. The wealthiest people in the world got much wealthier during COVID, while most people got poor. Because they understand the three asset classes and how they work. So it depends on where you are, how much capital you have, what your goals are, how much longer you expect to live, and what are you trying to do? Are you trying to preserve your capital? Are you trying to take your capital and have it make money? What is your objective? And I, and I cannot speak about this without speaking about the ultimate ROI is scripturally where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Lay not up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and thieves do break through and steal. Rather, lay your treasure up in heaven. There are places where we are promised hundredfold returns for certain acts of obedience here, a thousandfold return for those who stay true to him here and obey him it's the best roi it's the only guaranteed roi these three asset classes none of them are guaranteed they're the best that we have on earth with man-made systems and with governments that have sanctioned and over and oversee these asset classes globally but there's a much greater higher asset class and that is in wealth entirely different wealth economy and that is in heaven. It's an entirely different asset discussion when we're talking about how to lay up treasure in heaven. And I'm telling you, it is better that you spend your life laying up treasure in heaven than practicing everything I just taught you for how to lay up treasure on earth. The reason to understand these things on earth is so that you can accumulate and bless and help propagate the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ around the earth. Support the church of God. Support the kingdom work so that more people can hear because the time is coming when he will soon appear and, and, and we have to work uh, for the night is coming and, and the morning is coming and there will be no more time to labor for Christ. So what is real wealth? You and I both know real wealth is not financial wealth at all. Real wealth is our health. Real wealth is our marriage. Real wealth is our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. Real wealth is children that walk with God. Timothy, I have no greater joy than to know that my children walk in truth. That's wealth. Being on your deathbed, surrounded by family who loves God, and being ushered into the very presence of God Almighty. Singing amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Being surrounded by family and singing when peace like a river. It is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. That, dear friends, is real wealth. And the wealth and treasure that I hope you will spend a lifetime investing in.